as we head over to all things ornithology. Now, the dictionary defines it as the methodological study and consequent knowledge of birds and all things that relate to them. But here in Canberra, we define it as Neil Hermes, who joins us on the line now. Neil, good morning. Josh, how are you going? Absolutely fantastic. Now, before we start, I've got some bird sounds here that you've sent on through to us. Okay. Okay. Did you want to? Did you want to get them straight out of the way? Let's let's play that out and see if there's anyone out there that can have a guess about what it might be. All right. I'm going to start with this one. Here we go. Now, people should be able to identify it from that shot. They're pretty distinctive birds. Oh, I should think so. 62551206 if you want to give us a buzz. Very distinctive one, that one. Oh, I think you might all be right. Over, all over Canberra, you could hear that bird. Yep. Or that flocks of birds uh, as they fly over, making that uh, amazing call. Mm-hmm. So let's see if there's anyone out there that can pick that one, Josh. Yeah, well, let's see. Well, we'll wait for some calls to roll on through, 6255-1206. But uh, in the meantime, now we're going to start with a bit of argy-bargy between our feathered friends because a recent article in The Garden, uh, in the Guardian has suggested that bird feeders bring out the worst behaviour in birds. What's the situation here, Neil? Well, Josh, I don't think it's the worst behaviour. I think there's other behaviours that might be regarded as worse. But, yes, there is. <laughs> yep. There is... Uh, what, what, look, what this little study did is it showed that around a bird feeder, because you've got a concentration of food, um, some birds will become aggressive to, uh, to maintain their position to continue to get the food. And look, it certainly, is, it certainly is true. You'll see it in the wild where there's a concentration of food in a place and birds will compete with one another to keep others away. But typically in the wild, the food will be spread out over a bigger area. Yeah. Whereas with a bird feeder, you've got it in a concentrated place. And yes, you know, you'll get a... A parrot will land on a bird feeder to get some seed, and another one will come along and jostle it away. Yep. And certainly, it is a, it is true. And this article was interesting, and it points out that one of the issues around feeding birds is that there can be aggression, um, because birds are wanting to maximise their opportunity to get a concentrated uh, lot of food. So, look, perhaps we should be doing some more research on this. Yeah. This is uh, this is an interesting interesting observation. Well, I, I guess just quickly, I mean, does this aggression depend on the breed? I mean, there would be some birds that are more aggressive than others, would there not? Uh, look, there's not only some species that would be more aggressive, but Often. I think some individuals would be more aggressive <laughs> as well. So, so, for example, I've seen feeders where, you know, corellas will have the priority over the white cockatoos and the white cockatoos priority over the galahs and the galahs priority over others. And then as a... Um, Rainbow lorikeet will turn up half half their size and move them all on. So, yes, I think it does depend on species, but also individuals as well. Oh, we could say that within our own race. Have you ever been to Aldi on a Wednesday? I'll tell you, that brings out the worst in some of them. Josh, one of the things I do in the show is not to make too many parallels between bird observations <laughs> and human observations. <laughs> Very good. Um, now, Ethel from Kingston, she was on the line. No, she will see if we can get her back on the line. But uh, in the meantime, now the US Sun has also put out an article about birds singing in the morning, which for some is the perfect way to start the day. But apparently there's reasons why they do this. Now, particularly when it comes to the robin, Neil, why is this? Well, look, it's an interesting little story, but look, I, I don't think it's, it's telling us a lot new. Um, we all know that birds sing for a variety of reasons. And they, they tend to, uh, to, uh, to sing more in the morning. Birds call for a range of reasons. They'll call to keep other birds away from food. They'll, they'll call to attract other members of the same species to a source of food. They'll, um, they'll, uh, they'll call because of danger. They'll call because they want to mate. But the mating stuff tends to happen more um, in the spring. And look, in the mornings, one of the things about calling in the morning is if you're just declaring your territory, Sounds travel much better in the early morning. If, when you're up early in the morning, you'd know, Josh, because you do an early show. Mm -hmm. Those early morning hours just before dawn and just after dawn are very quiet. Yes. So it's a perfect time if you're a small bird trying to proclaim your space yep. to get your message out better than you will when, the, when it's a busier sounding day, you know, later in the day. So, mm -hmm. yeah, birds call more in the morning. And, of course, they call more in the springtime. But they do it for a range of reasons. Yeah. But it's not just the morning. Uh, and, and I go back to the robins, you know, chirping first thing in the morning. But they're also one of the last birds to wind down for the evening as well. So they chirp of a night. 
Well, they do, yes, and and, uh, and that article is talking about European robins. We have similar species in Australia that we'll talk, uh, we'll talk, we'll call loudly in the mornings and then continue through the night. Many of our cuckoos do. Um, common birds like willy wagtails will, magpies do. Very so good. So that's, that's, a, that's, that's a common pattern in some species uh, all around the world. Mm-hmm. Very good. Now, I've got a question here from Ethel at Kingston who wanted to know where all the black swans have disappeared to. Oh, that's an easy answer. Right. Um, with all the rain that we've had, the whole of inland Australia is a swamp. Okay. So so um, what happens over sort of a five, ten-year cycle is when we have dry weather in the inland, the birds like swans and other water, waterfowl like other ducks will well, all... they move to where it's wetter, to, don't they? Where it's wetter, and they tend to come to the coast, yep. um, down, places down the south coast, you know, along the Victorian coast, or wherever there happens to be wetlands along the mountains. And these, these are what we call refuge areas. These are places where, you know, more or less all the time there's water. So there'll be a place for them to live. But at this time of um, the, the, the El Nino cycle, of course, there is water everywhere. So they've spread out. So um, if you go to our wetlands locally, you won't see nearly as many wetland birds as you would have, say, uh, a couple of years ago when things were pretty dry out west. Um, uh, but they'll be back as the inland dries out because what happens, of course, is they breed up in large numbers and then those numbers of birds, as the, as the inland dries out, they need somewhere to go. And amazingly, it's one of the amazing things about these birds is they, they know where there's water. They can turn up in a place like, like Lake Eyre. You know, how do they know that, you know, they're, they're on Lake Burley Griffin and they know that Lake Eyre is filled. How do they know this? Uh, but, they, but they do and off they go. It ha- same happens with pelicans. So the reasons why we don't have as many swans around um, is uh, is because of the way the pattern of, of, of weather that was had in the last year or so. No, the party's in middle Australia, isn't it? It's like a BNS ball for them. So. Oh, look, I tell you, Lake, Lake Eyre is just absolutely, you know, you wanted to do some human analogies there. It's the, it's the place to be. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> um, I'm just going to play that sound one more time because uh, if anyone wants to call on through, 6255-1206. So here's a reminder, this is the bird sound that we're trying to identify. Very common across Canberra, correct, Neil? Yeah, well, very quite obvious across Canberra. Not, yeah, there's not large numbers of them, but very obvious. Large birds that uh, uh, you'll frequently see in the evenings as they're coming into roost uh, around the, particularly the pine plantations around the city. Very good. We'll get your answers on through. 62551206. Give us a buzz down here at 2CC, 19 to 10 now. In the meantime, we're having a chat with Neil Hermes, who's an ornithologist, author and all-round good guy. And it looks as though, Neil, we've had a couple of calls in regard to uh, identifying that bird sound. Paul from Coimbium, what do you think? No, it's not. I want to know something about a bird. Oh, my apologies. What do you got? It's a, a black and white bird, white belly. Uh, black and white tail being a top. It's not a, you know, looks like a small version of a magpie, but it's. Uh, first, it's not a willy wagtail because I know what they, they look like, but it's sort of about a bit bigger than a willy wagtail. And when you, when you look at it, you think it sort of looks a bit like a magpie, but it's not. It's not a magpie, no. no yeah, it's not a magpie. so I, I it's think. It's all white what belly. Is, I think what you've got is a butcher bird. That's and what I think. And, the and they're related to magpies. Are they? Yep. Um, and, and when you look at them first, you think, oh, look, is that a small magpie? But the, That's what I thought, But they're yeah. animal birds called, called a grey butcher bird. They're quite, you know, it's quite abundant in the ACT. You get them around our houses. Um, uh, they come in. They, they have a very, very attractive call. Uh, when you hear it, you won't forget it. You'll, you'll recognise it. Like magpies have a, a very rollicking, um, yeah, lovely cool. call. Like running around the ground, getting getting grubs out of the ground. That's all they do. Yeah, yep. And um, and sometimes we were talking about bird feeders before. Sometimes they'll come in if you're feeding magpies. They'll come in and get a feed as well. But the bird you've got, I I, I guess, is a grey butcher bird. Um, the adults are more uh, uh, smartly uh, plumaged than the juveniles. You may get young birds as well, and that that don't look quite as black and white. Um, but that's what I'm guessing it is. What's a pie so well butcher bird? Uh, no, a grey a grey butcher bird. That, yeah, but what is a word? It's got pied, p i e d. Pied, pied. There is there, there's another bird. There is another species called a pied butcher bird. They occur in the inland. The word pied means black and white. Oh, so, so 
something something that is black and white in the bird world is often called a pied something. So we have pied stilts, pied oyster catchers, pied butcher birds. Um, it's an old-fashioned word meaning black and white. That's how we get the word pied. There you go, Paul. You learn something new every day. Thank you very much. For that. No worries. No Paul. worries, Paul. Thank you. Mate, you did very well there, Neil. I mean, when he said black and white, I would have said magpie straight away as well. So, no, you did very well to identify that. But uh, I suppose with 50 years' experience, that's uh, that's what you do best, isn't it? Well, you, you do pick up a few things along the way. <laughs> very good. Now, uh, Des is identifying that bird sound. Thank you very much for your patience, Des. What do you think it is? Hey, how are you, mate? Uh, that's a big yellow, uh, yellow tail cop too. Neil? It certainly is. Well done, the yellowtail black cockatoo. Oh, he's done so, very well. Right. Where, where do you hear them, Des? Oh, look, I, I live down in Dunlop, and they po- occasionally pop down here. But I uh, saw three on Wednesday, actually. So then it rained for three days. So yep, yep. Today, today hasn't rained yet. So, but generally, when you see them, they uh, generally means it's going to rain for a few days afterwards. That 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 is a, that is something that's often said about yellowtail black cockatoos. One of the things I find spectacular about them is when they're in their flocks and they're flying along. They're they're just massive oh, they're birds and they have this beautiful big, you know, uh, sort of lolping flight and this long tail. They're just and when they do that call as well, it's very haunting. Often oh. here in the afternoon when they're coming yeah. into roost. Yeah, no, they're unreal. They're an awesome bird. Awesome. They bird. are. They are. Thanks very much and well done. All right, gentlemen. Thank you very much. You have a good day. Thank you. Yellowtail black cover too. Good on you, Des. So uh, Des calling us there and identifying that as the yellow... Uh, sorry, yellow... Which Go again, Neil. <laughs> Yellow, yellow tail, black, black cockatoo. cockatoo. There you go. We got that out in the end. Well, very good. Well, we've had a lot of fun this morning and certainly found out things about birds that we didn't know before. And as always, we thank you very much for your time. Okay, and if people want to check out more about what I'm doing, they can check out things on neilhermes.com.au where I have YouTube material and. And trips that I do and other things. So, Josh, thanks very much for this morning. No worries. So, neilhermes.com.au, you can head over there. And there's some great pictures on there as well and some great tools. I was having a look through there earlier and certainly looks like a lot of good fun. It is 12 minutes to 10. This is the Canberra Weekend.